together yes. and to study the word. Amen. Yes. Amen. Since we're going to be studying Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 8, uh, you will know that they were celebrating the feast of the trumpets. And then afterwards they, they would celebrate uh, the feast of tabernacles. But the feast of trumpets was done specifically uh, to announce the festivals. You see? And uh, again, they had different kinds of way in which they would blow the trumpet. Sometimes to gather the camp, uh, to get ready for a gathering. Sometimes to go out to battle. Sometimes it's to uh, call them to different camps in the wilderness. We get together, you see, and have an assembly for the Lord. So there was many things that were done. But you see, that's why I, I blew the trumpet now because we're going to be studying in respect to that. Uh, it's uh, good because in our study uh, we got the handout you will find in our handout in uh, study number six Ezra and Nehemiah which we are studying responding to God's word you have a, a chart a chart and this chart if you could see it you should have one a copy it will give you the month and the name of the months in the Hebrew of the Israelites when they would celebrate a specific festival. And here they're going to be celebrating in the month of Tishri, number seven, which is here in our chart, in our calendar. You got to look for it. It's right. You have it in the, your handout, you see. Uh, which is going to be the Feast of Trumpets, the first day on the seventh month, the first day of the seventh month. Uh, and this is where we're at now in Nehemiah chapter eight. We're going to be looking at chapter eight and chapter nine. I don't know if we go into chapter 10, but at least we're going to be looking at those two chapters of Nehemiah. And uh, as you can see in your chart, in the handout, you will find that it falls in our calendar, it falls on September, October. You will see it's there, it says Rosh Hashanah as the first day, Feast of Trumpets. You know that the Jews celebrated Rosh Hashanah, and uh, that's more like, than anything else, uh, the first at uh, the first uh, day of the year, of, that is, of the uh, religious uh, civil year of the Jews. Here we have it according to the Word of God as the seventh month, not uh, the first year, but that's the way they celebrate it. And then you have uh, in your chart, you have Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and Tishri 10, uh, which would be the tenth day of the seventh month. You see, again, uh, looking at it in our own calendar will be September and October, you see. And uh, for them, it's in the month of Tishri. Most of these names here, even are Chaldeans, meaning Babylonians, because they, will, they would uh, get those names that they were in the Babylonian captivity. As we recall last time, we did study about Ezra. I got to make a correction because last time I did say that uh, it was Nehemiah that came first, but it was Ezra, the one that came first uh, from the... From, from Babylon to Jerusalem. So he was the one about four, 458 uh, B.C. before Christ, you see. And then, uh, four, I'm sorry, 500, yeah, 458. And then we have Nehemiah in 444 B.C. before Christ, you see. And then we have this uh, reform that is being made here uh, as the exiles come back to Jerusalem from Babylon. Uh, one important thing that we're going to be looking at is the Word of God, right? Because the Bible study is called responding to the Word of God. Okay. We're going to look at something that is very uh, uh, specific and that it, it comes out a lot here in these chapters, and that is the Word of God. It is called the Torah for the Jews which is the law, the instructions in which God has given them for them to follow and to obey God, uh, the Torah, which is the Word of God here. You see, uh, it's very important for us 
to always study the Word of God, right? And we need to study the Word of God. Mm -hmm. It is sad that many, even Christians, don't study the Word of God that much. You see, I mean, we're included in all this. I myself have neglected many times to really study the Word of God or have time to uh, do it in reality. But we must come to the Word and we must be pricked to conviction of understanding that as we uh, read the Word, we know more about God and uh, He speaks to us through His Word. That's why He left His Word for us to understand. And... Uh, this is one of the things we're going to be looking at here as the word is exalted here uh, with the with exiles that are here now back in Jerusalem as we go into Nehemiah chapter 8. Okay, I'm going to be reading first the first eight verses of Nehemiah chapter 8. I'm going to be looking, in, looking at it, uh, into it. Okay. Okay. Uh, first of all, let's let's look at these questions. How often do you think a Christian should read the Bible, and why? What would be? Uh, what do you think? Oh, every day, I guess. Every day. Very good. Every day. Anybody else? How often do we do you think a Christian should read the Bible? What's that, Flo? Daily, every day, daily. Uh huh. Yeah. How do you heart? Yes. Okay. That's right. And for guidance. For guidance. Okay. How often do you think a Christian should hear the Bible preach or taught, and why? So we said that Christians should read the Bible every day, right? But how often uh, do you think a Christian should hear the Bible preach or taught? Every time you go to church. Every time you go to church? Yes. Well, we go to church on Sundays, right? And uh, Wednesday will be another day, which we have service here on Wednesdays. Uh -huh. Wednesday. So it'll be like two, twice a week, I guess, if it's uh, done on a regular basis, right? Well, uh, it's important to read the Bible. It says on a daily basis, yes. You know, it's, it's good for us to have a devotion. Yes? You can listen to the Word of God from away from church. Isn't that not I mean... Mm -hmm. Listen to the Word of God. You don't have to be exactly in church, but you can listen to it, you know, anywhere else, right? Because if you're sick and you're not able to make it Wednesday night, uh -huh. last Sunday is the last time you heard the Word of God from Sunday to Sunday. Uh -huh. so you yeah, any any day, right? And you could uh, uh, listen to a good sermon too uh, of a pastor who really has insight of the word, and yeah. you could be edified, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so we do have to uh, listen to the word being taught, right? Because we need that. The the, the word of God says, yes, Julie. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing from the Word of God. That's right. Yes. That's right. So that's all very important in reality, right? And this is something, okay, that many are neglecting. Listening to the Word of God and reading the Word of God. This was a problem that was happening with uh, the Israelites that were back in Jerusalem from the exile. And we could look at them and we could identify ourselves with them too, right? Because God left us these this stories of what happened in ancient times so we could learn. Learn to emulate that which is good and learn to uh, put to the side that which is not. Because God is a, it's, it's very, uh, a, it's very objective in his teaching to us but he's very subjective in telling us what to do because he knows what's good for us so we need to read the word and listen to the word as sister Julie was saying because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God so we need very important to, to have that so uh, we have to have that in mind and as we are talking about this 
we should, if we have not done it, it's good for us to start doing a devotional in our houses, us, uh, ourselves, you know, to start getting into the habit of reading the Word of God more and studying the Word of God better, praising the Lord and uh, praying to Him. We're going to look at a, a prayer too here because uh, chapter 9 speaks about prayer. Well, it's, it, it's a prayer there that is, that is uh, given unto the Lord of, of hearts that are committed to the Lord, that are uh, penitent unto the Lord in which they will want now God above all in their lives. That's what we do, have to do always. Okay, so let's look at verses 1 through 8 first. Let's read those verses. Okay. Jeremiah, right? Uh, Nehemiah, that's right. The book of Nehemiah, chapter 8. When the seventh month came, all the people gathered as one man on the square before the water gate. They asked Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses which Yahweh had prescribed for Israel. Accordingly, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, consisting of men, women, and children, all enough to understand. This was the first day of the seventh month on the square before the water gate, in the presence of the men and women and children, all enough to understand. He read from the book from early morning till noon. All the people lis listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden dais erected for the purpose. Beside him stood on his right Mathathiah, Shema, Anaya, Uriah, Helkiah, Amasiah. On his left, Pedaiah, Mashael, Malkijah, uh, Hash, Hashbum, Hashbanada, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. In full view of all the people, since he stood higher than all the people, Ezra opened the book. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed Yahweh, the great God, and all the people raised their hands and answered, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and faced the ground, prostrated themselves before Yahweh. Yeshua, Bani, Jeremiah, Jamim, Akub, Shabbatiah, Hodiah, Masaiah, Kelita, Sariah, Hosabab, Hanan, Peliah, who were Levites, explained the law to the people while the people remained standing. And Ezra read from the law of God, translating and giving the sense so that people understood what was read. Okay, good. You know, the, the, when it's when it's when starting to uh, teach people, especially when we go to seminaries uh, to study the Word of God, this is one of the texts that is used uh, specifically for you to start knowing, understanding the Word of God, you see. And this is specific, uh, a specific uh, incident here with, uh, in the book of Nehemiah. And you see here Ezra. As you remember, as you recall, uh, remember Ezra? As we had that uh, study last time about Ezra, as he came, uh, and the purpose for him to came to, to Jerusalem was to teach the people <coughs> the law of God. And why? Because the people have forsaken the word of God. They have forsaken the law. Again, they will call it the Torah, the law. And what is the law composed of, of what it's speaking about? I mean, what, what uh, in the Bible, where is the Torah or the law? Can anybody tell me? First five books of the Bible. Okay. That's right, right? Uh, okay. Yes. That's true. The first five books of the Bible, which is the book of Moses, as we understand, right? Uh, Moses wrote them, uh, as we understand and we believe in this inspired word of God. Moses wrote the first uh, five books of the Bible. We're talking about Genesis. We're talking about uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Right. And it is called the law because God speaks to his people through them, giving them a specific statutes, precepts, laws, rules for them to live by so they could obey God. Right? So there would be a people that really obey the Lord. But what had happened here, people have forgotten that. Uh, it's interesting because I know that there are many... Uh, uh, statistics in which people have m Bibles, many people have Bibles, uh, Christians especially have Bibles 
but yet statistics show that not many read them, you see. And again, the Bible keeps being the number one book in the whole world, you see, but yet not many read it. And many even have many copies and uh, they just have it, you know, as ornaments around the house. So it's time to get the dust off of, off of our Bibles and start reading and getting into the Word of God, you see. So here we see the law being read by Ezra, you see. And uh, if we go, uh, we see that Ezra was uh, leading the service and instructing the Torah, the, the law. He was given the understanding of what the law meant. In other words, he was giving the ex, uh, explanation. He was explaining to the people what the law was teaching, what he was saying. You see, just as you would see the pastor preaching the word, and then he explained the word so we could make sense of it, we could not understand, because God gives uh, gifts of, of teaching the word. So a pastor will have that and teach the word and make it uh, very understandable for the people would, you know, start digesting the word and put it into the souls and their minds and live by it, uh, to live the word of God. Here, again, it's the Old Testament. Here, the law is being taught, is being made clear for everybody to understand better. You see, that's, that's because, remember, right, Ezra was a scribe and a priest. Was, he was uh, a master teacher of the word, Ezra. And he had some Levites that will help him. You know who are the Levites, right? Anybody can tell me who were the Levites? Priests. And what else was? Uh, were they some people that came from other countries? The Levites? How about you, Kathy? You don't remember? Was that... They were priests. Okay. Were they priests from uh, Moab or from Assyria or from where? No, they were Israelites. They were where? They were Israelites. That's right. Levites were Israelites. That's right. You said they were, meaning they were from the people of God. They were Israelites. They were a specific clan uh, from within the tribes of Israel. And they were chosen specifically to minister uh, the Lord. Yahweh, God Almighty, you see. And they were taken by God so they could minister in the temple, you see. So those Levites, I'm going to say it's like the clergy now. We might say in this time, the clergy, you see. Not the laymen, but the clergy, the one that were officiating and uh, ministering in the things of God. So these were the Levites that were helping uh, Ezra. And these Levites were trained, too, to help the people understand the word of God better. That's what we see here in this part, in verse 7. It says that, uh, well, we, we saw a f a names, you know, very strange to us because these names, uh, we don't uh, know them, especially in our English language or Spanish language. These names are very uh, strange, right? But these are the names of these Levites that were helping Ezra, you see, and uh, so the people will understand better the word of God. Uh, these Levites. There were 13 Levites, and then there were other Levites mm -hmm. that were trained in reading the scripture. Very important, you see, for, for us to understand and know that uh, we need to really uh, get to the understanding of the Word of God. That's in uh, verse 8. Now let's go to verse 9 through 12 of that and this same. Uh, Chapter 8, you see verse 9 and 12. Let me see who could read it. Can Flo read that? 9 through 12? Verse 9 through verse 12. Yeah, 9 through 12. And Nehemiah, which is the priest, priest Adolf, and Ezra, the priest of the scribe, the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This, is, this day is only unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat and fast, and drink the sweet and spend portion unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this is for this day is only unto our Lord. Neither neither be sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites killed 
all the people saying, Hold your peace, for the day is holy. Neither be ye grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to spend portion and to make great marriage, because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, do you see uh, a specific thing about saying here, this day is holy? You see, it's like a, a triple refrain concerning, concerning the holiness of that day. Three times uh, it's been said there, this day is holy. You see, as a festival day. And, a, and, and there's an obligation not to grieve. It's telling the people not to grieve. Why were the people grieving? Why were they crying? Why will people start crying, you know, because, I mean, the law was read, but now people started crying. What do you think happened? That's right. So we see here that the word did affect in the people's hearts, especially on those who are receptive and are waiting to hear from God and want to be filled with things of God, you see. So this happened as the people were listening. What you said there, yes. wanting to hear from God, mm -hmm. and they opened their hearts. Because many That's times, right. sometimes we will come to church and our minds are on somewhere places, else. Mm -hmm. And we're not, if, if we're not receiving the word, it's not because the person is preaching. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's our own fault. Yep. That's right. The thing is that, and we could learn from here and what it is to really want from God, you see. They started weeping because they were being pricked to their hearts of conviction of sin. And why is that? Because the law, the Torah was being read to them, and they acknowledged they were not fulfilling. They were not obeying God's law. And they would see, remember that in the law of God, especially on, on, on the books of the law, we find there are many curses too for not obeying the word of God. They acknowledged that they were under curse in many ways for sinning against God. You see, so now they were weeping because the word of God struck in their hearts. And you know, that's what the word of God does to the sinner, right? When a sinner is asking God for forgiveness, and a sinner is truly sincere and repentant in his heart, he will call out to the Lord, and the first thing that God is going to show a sinner how sinful he is. You see, he does with us as we came to know the Lord. You see, when God saved me about uh, 20, 20, yeah, 23, 24 years ago, that's what God first showed me, how, how sinful I was. How I was going in the, in, in the road, in a way of perdition and going to hell. I didn't know that. I was uh, ignorant in my so-called uh, justice that I have, my so-called righteousness that I had, you see, until God showed me that I was going straight down. And because of His grace, I, I was alive, you see. That's another thing that we're going to look into. God's pervenient grace. Meaning a grace in which, grace, you know, it's, not, it, it's, a, it's a gift we don't deserve. God's given it to us. Pervenient meaning that even when we're ignorant and doing our own sinful ways, God already started the work to save us. Mm -hmm. You see. And that's the wonderful thing about the Lord. That's why the Apostle in the book of Romans says that even when we were dead in our sins, Christ died for us. We were ignorant, and Christ died for us. We were doing things that are, were wicked against the Lord, against humanity and stuff, and yet Christ died for us. That's God's provenient grace. You see, He already started the process to save us. Uh, he loves us. He calls us. We know on that side of heaven, God knows everything. On this side of heaven, we are here. We just got to follow God's instructions. You see, so the people were pricked to their hearts. And they started crying because they acknowledged they were not fulfilling God's law. They were not obeying God's law. They have forsaken the law, you see. They started crying. The thing is that since they show repentance in their hearts, even that is very important because, you know, when you are in a tribunal and you are in a court of law and the, the, the person that has committed a crime doesn't show any remorse, even the judge will be more hard to that person. Mm -hmm. But when the person shows remorse, shows conviction, shows repentance, you see, the judge, you know, kind of like helps him, gives him a break because he shows that that person is really, you know, uh, in his heart, repentant. 
of what he has done. He acknowledges what he has done, and that's how God is. We're going to look at the, uh, at the prayer in chapter 9, you see, how God's grace is upon the people, and how many cried out to the Lord, and the Lord came. It's a cycle of, uh, of repenting, uh, of God's deliverance, and then going back to sinning, but then God's grace. We're going to see that in, in the prayer in chapter 9, you see. But God's faithful and good. He's a God of mercies. Yeah. Chapter 9 says, you are slow to anger. You are a God of mercies. Uh, that mercy is unfaithful love from the Lord unto us, you see. And so, now, because they were, this was happening, remember, they were celebrating a day of joy. So they couldn't weep, they couldn't grieve. The, the evidence was there that they really repented and were listening and, and receiving from the Lord by Ezra reading the, the book and the Levites that were helping Ezra. But now, uh, the Levites were telling the people to not weep. Do not grieve because this is a holy day. Three times we say it's a holy day. And this is a day of rejoicing. We are celebrating. Now, as we're in the, the law of God, now we're going to go according to the prescription that God has for, for us from the law. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, this is taken from Leviticus chapter 23 and, uh, and Deuteronomy chapter 31, books of the law. You see, the Torah. Uh, so they were now going with this, in respect to this. Uh, of uh, rejoicing and celebrating in the seventh month, which is the month of uh, Tishri, Tishri, that is, see, uh, the feast of the trumpets here, and now we're going to be celebrating as they gather together again, in which they wanted to follow God's uh, prescribed feast days, the Feast of Tabernacles. You see. So now here is a day holy, they must refrain from grieving, and they must rejoice. What it says here? That the, that the joy of the Lord is what? Strength, Strength right? Uh, the word here, in reality, is translated as protection, as refuge, you see. So in other words, the joy of the Lord in your hearts, in your minds, in your life is going to be your protection. It's going to be your safeguard. It's going to protect <coughs> you, secure you. You don't have to uh, be paranoid <laughs> about things that are going out there because of what's happening to people. You see, uh, things randomly, you see, no. The joy of the Lord, when you have God's joy in your heart, you know you are secure because he is your protection. He's your, in other words, he's your stronghold that is the Lord. That's what David said, remember? Psalms, in the Psalms it says, you are my castle, you are my strong tower. I will run to you, O Lord of God, so I will have refuge in you. You see, you are a shield unto me. Yeah. This is David in the Psalms. You know, exalting the Lord and knowing that He is Yahweh is everything for us. And as we delight into taking in His Word and rejoicing in the Lord, we're going to be in, 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 in the shelter. That's God's shelter. Remember what Psalm says, Psalm 91, that those who, what, who go, who are under God's what, wings, they're there, they're protected. Amen. Like, a, say, a big eagle that's protecting her, uh, her chicks. So in the same way, the, the Lord is protecting us. Yeah. So here, Nehemiah, the, there's a name here. It's called the Tirshata. Uh, if you acknowledge there, it says uh, Tirshata. Tirshata, in my version here, is His Excellency. It says His Excellency. In other versions, it might even not found, be found. But this is a name that is given to governors. Uh, those governors here in, uh, in this post-exilic time, uh, it, is, it is said many times, uh, you know, in, in chapter 7, verse 65, 70, 10, 11, 10, 1, that is here. Uh, and we see the Tirshata, which means feared. And usually because there were governors that will... Uh, speak and they will have some uh, respect in respect to them of, of doing what, what they were uh, being instructed to do by God. So the Tershata means the governor. So here Nehemiah is the Tershata, the, the governor. And uh, then we have uh, how the people now go their way merrymaking. The people have go their way and to uh, feast and to send out portions to others, in other words, to chair. You see, that was part of the feast, too, remember? The feast of the Lord, people will rejoice, will eat, and they will share with the less fortunate. 
And the law too was that when you, when you ever uh, started doing your crops and you went into the harvest and uh, pick up, you all have to live for the poor. You will never take everything. Please. You have to because I will stand. In that way, God will provide for the less fortunate. So the ones who had abundance will share with those who didn't have any. You see, it was, uh, the law of God was so perfect that it, it accommodated for everybody to be, uh, you know, uh, sharing everything that they will not be wanting in, in all. Yes, ma'am. You know, it reminds me of two houses down the cross right now. These people are moving. Yeah. And it's a big thing. And it's blah, blah, blah. Hmm. Now, for two or three days, people have been coming <coughs> and digging through the stuff that they put out. So okay. Trash yeah. men uh -huh. or whoever this is you come from. Yeah. Uh, I, it was hard for me to believe that this many people would come to go through that. But what you're saying now, that just comes home to me. Yeah. That God does provide. Yes. Not saying that anybody's better than anybody. Right. Yeah. But they are really, I mean, they're sifted through. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing to me that you could bring that up. Yeah, it's interesting because the Word of God tells us about that and Sometimes some things that we don't use, it's better for us to give yeah. it away to other people that it could be useful, yeah. you know, because sometimes we wind up throw, throwing things away, you see, and many things are very useful for others who are in need of yeah. it, you yeah. see, and that way, you know, we could share and we could even proclaim the word of God to yeah. others in that sense. Yeah. So, yeah, God is good, so we could start, you know, really doing that. Uh, yes. Yes. Or they'll set something. If it's furniture, they'll put a please take a sign. And mm -hmm. this is the curb separate from the yes. side. And then this way, if people are driving up and down the street or walking, whatever, if they need that stuff, they can just pick it up. And when I first went there, that really impressed me. Yes. The area was like, wow. But you know, that's yeah, a good and idea. Was <laughs> and clean, and you could just go and get it. Yes. Yes. And this way, they didn't hang on to it. That, that, that's good, especially for us to. Well. You know, start sharing stuff that we don't use that could be used yeah. for others, you know. Yeah. So it's good. Yes. So people went home and they were now glad and they were merry. Why? Because, you know, they were celebrating the feast of the Lord. They were going according to what the Lord says in His Word. Now let's look at verses 13 through 18. You see? And in these verses of 13 through 18, we will find that there is a second convocation here, but here in this convocation is going to be with the clergy, the temple clergy, and reassemble for Torah story with Ezra. Now Ezra was like, you know, having a meeting with all uh, the Levites and all the temple clergy so they could uh, go into that about following the law of God, you see. Uh, let me see verse 13. On the second day, the heads of families of the whole people and the priests and Levites gathered around Ezra, the scribe, to study the words of the law, the Torah, that is. And uh, written in the law that Yahweh had prescribed through Moses, they found this. Uh, they found this. The sons of Israel are to live in shelters, tabernacles, during the feast of the seventh month. As soon as they heard this, they issued a proclamation in all their towns and in Jerusalem. Go into the hills and bring branches of olive, pine, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make shelters, as it says in the book. The people went. They brought back branches and made themselves shelters, each man on his own roof, in their courtyards, in the precincts of the temple of God, on the square of the water gate, and the square of the gate of Ephraim. The whole assembly... All who had returned from captivity put up shelters and lived in them. The sons of Israel had never done such a thing from the days of Joshua, son of Nun, till the present, and there was great merrymaking. Each day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. They celebrated the feast for seven days. On the eighth day, as prescribed, there was a solemn assembly more or less the first day and the last day, which is the eighth day of this feast. Now remember, this feast is the Feast of the Tabernacles. They came together 
to study the Word of God, they found out, you see, uh, there's, there was a lot of ignorance or negligence, too, of not doing what God said in His Word, you see. And here they found out because the seventh month was a very important month. You see, the seventh month there were many celebrations and feasts that were going on. And you know that all this is more than anything else uh, a type of what Jesus, our Messiah, is going to fulfill in, in the end times, right? And when he came to us about 444 years afterwards, after this happened, when Jesus came, the Messiah came, remember, he was there exalting uh, uh, his Father, God Almighty, and him celebrating some of the feasts, and him pointing himself at himself as being fulfillment of those feasts. Now the Feast of Tabernacles is one of those here in which they're going to start celebrating, and it's going to be celebrated on the 15th day of the month, or the 7th month, that is. Now there is no mention of the 10th day. If you recall, the 10th day is another, another celebration, but this celebration is solemn, real solemn. It's very serious because it is called the Day of Atonement, in which nowadays the Jews will call it Yom Kippur, you see. The Day of Atonement was a day of repentance, was a day of fasting, was a day in which uh, the people had to come before the Lord with a repentant heart, and they will sacrifice uh, the goats, two of them, you see. They will sacrifice these animals, and they represented God's provision for their sins of repentance. And one, well, they will sacrifice one, and the other will sacrifice in the sense that it was taken into the wilderness to get lost, to be lost, you see. One was sacrificed, one was slaughtered, and the blood was taken into the holy place. And the tabernacle here is in the temple, of course, in the holiest of holiest, and that blood was taken like that, meaning that God was accepting the uh, forgiveness by the blood of this victim, which was this animal, you see, into the holiest of holiest, and so the people would be forgiven for that time, only for that time, because they have to repeat that the next year and keep on doing it like that. The other animal, you see, other goat, was the, 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 the Levite or the priest that was there would put his hands upon this animal and convey the sins of the people onto the animal in that sense by praying upon that animal. And then the animal was taken by a specific clean Levite person that was taken to be taken out into the wilderness, into the desert to be lost. So it was like in the land of nowhere. That goat will be wandering in the land of nowhere. That signifies that the Lord has taken our sins and thrown them into forgetfulness. Or to throw them into uh, the deep bottom of the sea to never remember them again. That was the significance of this uh, uh, of this specific uh, rite that they would do on the 10th day of the 7th month, which is the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, you see. There is no mention of it here because they will have to celebrate it. Oh, there's no mention. We acknowledge that it was celebrated because they wanted to follow the prescription of what God said from the law, you see. But here they were focusing on the merrymaking and they were focusing on God's forgiveness upon them. Because now they were back into Jerusalem. Remember that here Nehemiah has just uh, put the doors and the gates were built uh, with great opposition from the people that were around, around there. If you will recall chapters before that, you will find Tobiah and Sambalat that came against Nehemiah, telling him, trying to uh, intimidate him to stop the work, you see. But they were not intimidated because they were with the Lord God Almighty, and they finished it in 52 days, he says. You see, and so they got scared, the people around the enemies of the Lord. They got scared. It's God that put the fear into them, so they will not bother the work of God here. You see, so uh, they were going to celebrate uh, this here, so they have to be, uh, be ready to do this in order to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And you will find here uh, that the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles it's in line with the Torah. They wanted to do it according to prescribed things of the, uh, of the Lord. On the 15th day of the month, you see, uh, let me see my notes here. Yes. And it, in, in, uh, it goes in line with Leviticus chapter 15, I'm sorry, chapter 23, and Deuteronomy chapter 31, 10 through 12, you see. And uh, a careful study of the Torah 
can explain the festival. In other words, when they study the Torah, the law of God, you see, they will explain the meaning of the festival n rather than on the festival itself. Not just to have a feast and be merry and stuff. What is the purpose? Why are we doing this? That's why it's called the feast of the Lord, the feast of Yahweh. You see why? Because it was God that instituted that in order for them to understand and know what was the purpose of that. Now the purpose of the Feast of the Tabernacle is here, uh, we could read it in uh, Leviticus chapter 23. Uh, and uh, it says that because they were living in booths, they were living in tabernacles in the wilderness, you see, so they will not forget, the Israelites will not forget how God provided for them in his mercy and his grace, all those years, 40 years in the wilderness, provided for them as they were living in booth, you see, camping out there, and God providing and giving them a pillar of, of uh, a cloud in the daytime to guide them and a pillar of fire from heaven at nighttime. It's interesting and all awesome to see that because I would think that even uh, other uh, people from other other countries and, uh, and other uh, kings and stuff, they will look from afar off and they will see that great pillar of fire from afar off and the Israelite camping there and they will be scared knowing that the God of these people was a great and awesome God that even sent fire from heaven and guide them, you see. That's why they were even afraid when they got re uh, ready to conquer the land because they all, are, they were all knew that the God of Israel was a true and powerful God. And so here we find that how God provided for them in the wilderness journey, you see, and so they will not forget God's grace upon them. And by doing this, by going into shelters, doing booth and all this, that will be impregnated in their minds to not forget how God's gracious work was with them and protecting them and guiding them and providing them. Again, God is the refuge. What it says, the joy of the Lord is my safeguard, my refuge. So they have these shelters in which they will celebrate each day of the seven days of the Priest of Tabernacle and each day the law was read. It says here that Ezra read the law. Each day they will read the law of God. So, and it says here another thing is that uh, that they, had, they hadn't celebrated this feast even from the time of Joshua the Nun, uh, son of Nun. You see, that we're talking about uh, going back about uh, many years back. We're talking about going back to the time of the conquest, you see. And the thing about that is that they have not celebrated it specifically like this. Reading the word and uh, going into the booth. Because they are celebrated before that. But only in the sacrificial manner. As it is laid in Numbers chapter 29. In Numbers chapter 29 you will find, you will have that time to read afterwards. You will find that they wanted to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles but, uh, or the Feast but by sacrifices. But they're not actually going into doing the tabernacles. Here they wanted to do it correctly and completely as the Torah will let them do it. Which was make the booth, get some uh, branches, get all, all these uh, materials to make the booth and have the, the law of God read to them in all this. So another thing that we look into this is the parallel between Israelites who entered the land under Joshua. That's another thing. Remember how they entered the land to, uh, under Joshua. Bo both brought home at last by an exodus. By an exodus and were enjoying the keeping of the divine promise. In the time of Joshua, if you recall, uh, it was a joyous celebration because God, you know, has blessed them in going into the promised land. But here, they will return back to the promised land, you see, but now with, a, with an attitude and a heart to really have true conviction of not sinning against God and following His ways. And not to forget where God had, what God has done with them through all they have done in their lives. It is good for us to take inventory of our lives too and see God's goodness inside, in our lives from the beginning until now. 
how God has been so good to us in all this. We have had some bad times, it's true. Some tragedies have happened to us. But in the midst of all that, God was working for us. So it will be for our good. And we have even ourselves have done wrong, you see. And most of the things that maybe had happened because we did not really follow God's ways. But yet God was working with us to help us in all this. Now look, let's look at chapter 9. Chapter 9 is going to be the prayer. You see, it's going to be the prayer. This prayer is uh, tremendous. And this prayer seems to echo the divine condition of repentance laid down in Nehemiah's own prayer in chapter 1. Now, remember that Nehemiah prayed to the Lord at the beginning. You see, repentance. If you turn to me, you see, uh, as he prayed unto the Lord, Nehemiah, he says, uh, and remember, O Lord God, when you said, if you turn to me, if you return to you, the word here, remember, to return to me is speaking about repentance. If you come back to me through contrition of heart, you see, to come back to the Lord. If you turn to me, the prayer is an account of Israel sinning and then confessing that sin as we look into the prayer. And we see the references to returning or re returning unto the Lord in repentance. Uh, the direction God wanted them to go, that is, to take, you see, and he multiplies at the end of the prayer. The whole chapter 9 of Nehemiah, it will be good for you to read it and study it at home, because since we are almost running out of time, but for you to read it and study it at home, chapter 9 of Nehemiah, because if we break it down, you see, uh, Nehemiah, for example, the first five verses of chapter 9, Nehemiah, uh, we find here on the 24th day of this month, now the 24th day of the same month, which is the seventh month. So this is good with already the Feast of Tabernacles that have finished, you see, ended. Remember, it started in the 15th of the day, and then you have about eight days, because the eighth was the solemn day, you see, uh, which finished on the 22nd, and then two days afterwards, which is the 24th, it says here, the 24th day of this month, the Israelites, in sackcloth and with dust on their heads, assemble for a fast. So we see mourning, uh, being mourned, a mourning rite, indicating repentance, as you will find in other parts of the Bible. For example, in Joel, in Joel chapter 1, verse 13, 14, and, uh, and 2, 12, 14, when the, the prophet uh, calls the people of Israel for repentance, you see, let the priest cry before the altar of the Lord. You see, let the bridegroom and let the, uh, the bride come out. You see, why? And, um, and, and prostrate before the Lord to seek the Lord. This is all speaking about a morning rite and re of re of true repentance. And it says, In sackcloth and with dust on their heads assemble for a fast. Those of, those of Israel's stock separated themselves from all those foreign origin. Remember, we read that about in Ezra, when about the intermixed marriages with pagan uh, women, uh, the Israelites, they had to put them away. See, they could be holy. Now, the holy city says here, in respect to that sin, are separating themselves uh, from that. They stood confessing their sins and the transgression of their ancestors, uh, standing each man on his right position. They read from the book of the law of Yahweh, their God, for one quarter of the day, for another quarter, they confessed their sins and prostrated themselves before Yahweh, their God. So this is a time now to really come before the Lord in prayer. He says a quarter of the day or fourth of the day, uh, they will uh, divide the time, the Jews, into uh, four, four times, right? And it will be at 12 hours, and here will be three hours. So three hours in the morning, which is from 6 to 9, and all three hours from 9 to 12, to midday. So the first three hours, what they were doing? What they were doing the first three hours? In verse 2. They were reading the word, right? They were reading from the law. They were reading from the law, from the Torah. And the other three hours, they will be confessing their sins and crying out to the Lord. You see. Another thing that we're going to see here is when they cry out to the Lord. 
see tremendously with our hearts. There was a loud voice, tremendous loud voice. When you weep and when you come before the Lord, when you prostrate yourself, you see before the Lord. And you uh, inquire of the Lord. That's what was happening here, you see. For another quarter, they confessed their sins and prostrated themselves before Yahweh their God. On the Levites' platform stood Yeshua, Bunui, Kadmiel, Shebaniah, Buni, Sherebiah, Bani, and she che uh, Chenanai, calling loudly to Yahweh their God. They were calling and screaming out loud unto the Lord their God. And the Levites, Yeshua, Kadmiel, Bani, Hashbeniah, Jerbiah, Hodiah, Shebaniah, and Pethiah said, Arise and bless Yahweh our God. See, and now here in verse 6 starts the prayer. This is where you're going to go and look into the prayer. Just to break it down, verses 6 through 15, uh, in the prayer, just the first, uh, verse uh, 6, we find, Blessed be you, Yahweh our God, from everlasting to everlasting, and blessed be your name of glory that surpasses all blessing and praise. Then in 6 it says, Yahweh, you are the only one. You made the heavens, the heavens of heavens, with all their arid, the earth and all it bears, the seas and all they hold. To all these you give life. And the arid of the heavens bows down before you. So it starts out with praising the Lord and the Genesis account. It starts from Genesis 1 here in the prayer. To praising the Lord God Almighty. And then in verses 7 to 8. It speaks about Abraham. If you read the law in Genesis, you'll find that God chooses Abraham. It speaks about Abraham, the chosen one. Then in verses 9 through 10, the Egyptian bondage and God's uh, signs and wonders upon Pharaoh. We find that in verses uh, 9 through 10. In verses 11 through 15, God's redemption and the wilderness journey to the promised land. The gift of the good Torah. In other words, of the law of God. The gift. It's a gift. The law of God. This, what we have, the word, is our gift to us that God has left us. So we could, you know, appreciate it, put it into our hearts and our minds, so we could follow his ways. Now as Christians, through the Messiah, Jesus Christ will fulfill all this. Remember, Jesus was the one to fulfill the law. We can never, never live by the law, you see. Because if we try to live by the law, we utterly are going to perish because we cannot. We are sinners. And so because of that, Jesus came to save us, the Messiah. Jesus Christ came to save us. And so he fulfilled the law. So we could live by faith, you see. And now we uphold the law. What did Paul the Apostle says in Romans chapter, C, uh, chapter 6? He says, uh, so, you know, because we're under grace, we disdain the law? Not at all. We uphold the law now because we're under grace. We live by faith, you see. We are living by faith and not by the works of the law. Because Jesus has redeemed us. He has given us new life. And now we live a new life in which by grace we could please God. Because His Holy Spirit is going to be in us. Amen. So we could go in the way we should go. This study is about responding to God's word. And for us to exalt the, the word of God in our hearts, in our lives, and to live it. Look at the ancient Israelites. How they were pricked to their hearts in true conviction of sin and wanted to worship the Lord and keep the law of God exalted in their lives above all, the Torah in their lives above all, so they could follow God's ways, you see, and so that they would be blessed by the Lord. Now, remember, they have just come out of captivity in Babylon for 70 years because of their sins. And if you keep reading the prayer, this prayer here, for example, and then in verses 16 to 21, Israel sinning in the wilderness, was met by divine grace in, of Numbers 14 and 18 and Exodus 34, 6, when Moses interceded for them. Remember that God was going to wipe them out, and Moses says, Lord God, have mercy upon them. You see, then the nations will say that he took them out to, uh, to kill them in the wilderness, you see. And so that was a testing more than anything else, so that Moses interceded uh, before the Lord, and so God gave him a chance. But the Lord says, but those who have, have stiff neck and they are rebel against me, they will die and perish within these 40 years. But the sons that they say are going to perish in the wilderness, those are the ones that are going to go into the promised land, the next generation. It's very important for us to teach our children, the generation, you see, so they could come and uphold the word of God. Okay, so we're going to stop here. I want you to uh, read chapter 9, the prayer, as God will give you understanding the wisdom that the Holy Spirit guides.
Christ in all things. Amen. Let us pray. Amen.